Hey everybody, happy Tuesday? Thursday. Oh my gosh, I've got my day so wrong. I thought it was Tuesday. Thursday. Happy Thursday, everybody. I knew it started with a T though. Uh, Attorney Steve here. Hey, I wanted to go over tort. Some of the basic causes of action that we have in our legal system and every state's different. Every state's got their different versions of the laws, but I got a quick list. I'm gonna run down here. What is there, about 20, about 20 or so items. And I'm just gonna go over some of the various torts that maybe you should know or be converse, uh, conversant with, especially for you law students out there, my legal secretaries, paralegals, um, and just people who just wanna know a little bit more about the law uh, Attorney Steve here with you. Uh, <coughs> now I'm going to go down. This is kind of in alphabetical order. Um, number one, abuse of process. So these are called uh, torts or civil wrongs, things like that. And um, aiding and abetting, or let's go, uh, abuse of process. Let's start with that. That's where, let's say you're in a legal, you're in a legal proceeding and you try to file some motion that's just so far out of whack that everybody's going, what on earth is this person doing? And that could be an attorney, it could be a, a private litigant, and somebody would say, what on earth is this person doing? You could be found liable in a separate proceeding for abusing the legal process, okay? So uh, there are certain rules that you have to play by when you're in the legal system, you need to play by a set of rules. If you're going far outside those rules, where everybody's doing SMDH, shaking my damn head, um, there could be a cause of action for abuse of process. And really what that is, is just to cut it to a nutshell, is taking a legal action outside the permitted legal confines. And again, it's usually a SMDH where you just go like, where, what, where did this person go to law school? Like, you know, crazy, right? So um, that is abuse of process. It's also similarly tied into the tort of malicious prosecution. And in some states like Arizona, wrongful institution of a civil proceeding, okay? Uh, that's a tort, um, but I'll get to that when I get down here further on my list. So that's abuse of process, starting in the A categories. We also have aiding and abetting. You'll hear this all the time, okay? So um, you're aiding and abetting, encouraging, facilitating, enabling, you're doing all these things. Basically, it means you know somebody's doing a tort, you know somebody's doing something wrong, and you're helping them. You're saying, oh, yeah, 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 you could do it here, or, you know, let me help, or I can send an email for you, don't worry. Um, aiding and abetting will make you just as liable as the original actor, okay? <clears throat> So the original actor, hey, Frontline Lisi over there, everybody. <laughs> so she's on the phone. Uh, aiding and abetting. So don't encourage, if you know somebody's committing a tort, don't get a, don't got to get on board. Don't try to say, oh, let me just be your friend. I'll get on board. Yeah, we'll do it together. You know why? Because you're going to be just as liable as the other person. You know, so not always good to, to go along with wrongdoing. Um, next on our list of A's, we have, I have appropriation slash a right of publicity. Um, appropriation or misappropriation, as we sometimes call it, that's really taking something that doesn't belong to you. It's a simple way to put it. Um, not quite to the level of what you would say, like stealing or anything like that, but you're misappropriating somebody's um, stuff, things that belong to them, okay? For example, in the right of publicity, um, everybody in, everybody, you, all you people watching, thank you for joining. Good morning. Hope everything's going good. Good afternoon in some areas. Um, but everybody has a right of publicity. So this mug here, this mug, um, whether you think it's amazingly handsome and beautiful, or likewise, we have a right of publicity. We have a right to our name, our image, our likeness, and to exploit that. And what that means, and we also have the, the power to prevent people from exploiting our name, our image, our likeness, okay? It's called our right of publicity. And that is a right inherent to us. So if I, in other words, I wake up one morning and I pull out, my wife just got a cereal box from the store and I go, what? That's me. That's me on the cereal box. 
You know, somebody said, well, I thought attorney Steve was just one heck of a handsome man. I thought I'd put him on the cereal box. And I go, but they can't do that because that appropriates or misappropriates my name, image, and my likeness. So a misappropriation is another tort, civil wrong one person commits against another, okay? Um, let's go to the next under our A's, assault and battery. Now, most of you know what that is, right? Assault and battery, you know, people say it all the time, that's assault. Or you're at a, you're at a bar and somebody pushes somebody, hey, you assaulted me. Um, or somebody punches them in the face, that's a battery, that's a battery. And yes, assault and battery, um, as they say sometimes, assault and battery goes together like ham and eggs. Uh, that's what they say. Hello, this believes. How are you? Belize? This belies. Good morning. Good afternoon. Uh, but assault and battery is a tort. And these cases can can lead to pretty big damage cases if they go to court. You know, a lot of times, like in their, let's just say it's a fight case. There's always a question, well, who started the fight? And was the other defending themselves? So you always have this kind of red light, green light thing. And then you bring in all the witnesses. You try to figure out who was the bad guy. And then you find out both of them were drunk. And so it's kind of hard to, it's kind of hard to put the case together. But uh, assault and battery. Now, assault is uh, when you go up to somebody and you don't physically touch them, okay? So assault is when you get in somebody's face and you go, I'm gonna get you. Uh, that's assault, okay? You know, because you put someone in imminent apprehension that there's going to be a harmful or offensive bodily contact. So the key in assault is an imminent apprehension of a harmful or offensive bodily contact. Now, if you actually go, I'm gonna hit you, and you go a little too far and you hit their nose or their face, that's battery. The battery is the actual physical contact with another that is considered to be offensive, okay? So uh, if you spit on somebody, that's a battery, okay? If you throw a Frisbee and hit somebody in the head, that's a battery. Okay, these are called intentional torts. You intend to hit the other person and make bodily contact that would be deemed uh, unreasonable and offensive. There is a tort and you can be liable for the damages. Okay, so that's how it works in our legal system. Some people call assault and battery ham and eggs because usually you're gonna have one and the other. It doesn't always have to be. You can just have an assault and you can just have a battery or you can have you can have both the frontline Lisey's back here everybody frontline Lisey my amazing wife and business partner and love of my life and everything else she is here um so we're just uh kind of getting warmed up to uh start our day in our legal practice we have an intellectual property firm and uh we help a lot of people in infringement cases. We represent uh, people being accused of copyright infringement, bit torn infringement. Guys, tell your friends. You want to do your friends a favor? Tell them not to download Strike 3 Holdings movies on BitTorrent, okay? These cases lead to tens and twenties of thousands of dollars in settlement amounts. Tell your friends, hey, are you downloading and sharing Strike 3 porn movies? Don't do it. It's going to lead you to, trust me, they're out. They're scanning the internet. They're finding these things. Lots of big settlements. So we do things like that. We do software audits, uh, you know, Microsoft and Business Software Alliance, things like that. We also do cases where um, people are showing boxing fights at their restaurants or their bars and they don't have the license to do it. Okay, you've got to pay, you know, $1,000, two, $3,000 commercial license. If you're not doing that and you're showing the fight, that leads to problems. So we handle cases like that, infringement, also like photo infringement cases where you're using someone's image or they're using your images on their real estate websites and things like that. So we do a lot of uh, technology, internet law type of cases. So let's get back to my list here. That was assault and battery. Thank you guys for joining us today. Hope we're just just getting your legal wheels rolling. So you know, a little, you're a little smarter than the average bear, okay? So when you're talking law, you, you know a little something about it. I'm attorney Steve. Uh, I've been practicing for about, about 18 years now. I've handled over about 400 uh, litigation cases, state courts, federal courts, uh, administrative proceedings, all kinds of things. I love what I do. If it's not obvious, I love what I do. Uh, let's go to the next one. Attractive nuisance. Have you guys ever heard that one? 
probably not. Most people would, wouldn't even know what you were talking about. Attractive nuisance is this, okay? So say you have a, um, say you have a nice house near the beach, okay? And you have this, on your property, you have this, and there's no fence on your property, okay? But you have this gigantic whale that has stairs and you can climb up it and it's super high and slippery and dangerous. But you know kids that are walking by at the beach, um, they're going to go, what's that? It's an attractive nuisance. They're going to go, what's that? I want to go play on that. I'm going to touch it. I'm going to look at it. So if you have something that would be called attractive to like kids or whatnot, and they go, you, you know, they come on, they jump around, they get injured, they fall. And you say, well, you were on my property. Like, you know, you're, you're on, you're on your own. No, the law says, well, wait a second. That's an attractive nuisance. You know kids are going to come up to that. Why don't you put a fence up? So you're going to be liable for their damages because it was an attractive nuisance. Kids are just being kids. And so that what that does is that incentivizes the homeowner to take reasonable steps to um, safeguard. You know, if you know somebody's going to come jump on it, um, you know, be careful with it. So that's attractive nuisance. That's one. Most people will, you'll probably never hear that phrase again as long as you live, except from here. Um, breach of contract. You guys all know what a breach of contract is. That's pretty simple. We're getting into the B's here. Breach of contract. It's when you agree to do something. Well, then let's back up. A contract is nothing more than a promise or a set of promises that the law will enforce. That's in some very simple terms, a promise or a set of promises that the law will enforce. That's a contract. Now there's oral contracts, there's written contracts. Preferably you would want written, correct. If you got that, your wheels are spinning, you may be a future lawyer. So um, there's different kinds of contracts, but when you don't follow the terms of the contract, if you don't perform as required by the terms of the contract, you can be held in breach of contract. Now there's two types of breach. There's a minor breach, in which case the parties need to keep continuing their performance. And there's a major breach. That's when you can say, I'm stopping my performance. I'm done. I'm suing you. I'm suing you. And in some states like Arizona, you have a, uh, we practice in California and Arizona. In some case, in Arizona, if you have a written contract and somebody breaches it, you can seek, anyone? Bueller, Bueller, anyone? You can seek your attorney fees. So that's a really nice feature if you're in a state like Arizona. Check your state, guys, by the way. All states are different. I mean, check your states. You, you never know what, what your own state's going to have. So... Um, so that's breach of contract. When you have a breach of contract, typically the measure of damage is what's known as your expectation damages, what you expected. But again, like I said, in some states like um, Arizona, you can get your, your attorney fees as well. Um, also, there are limited cases where a breach of contract could allow you to seek attorney fees. Now, let me give you an example. Say you have an insurance contract where an insurance company says, look, I am going to insure you up to a million dollars if if um, if your roof leaks and then your roof leaks. And then you say, oh, thank God I've got insurance. And you go to your insurance company and they say, well, you know, we're not going to cover that. And you say, why? why? You have a contract. We're, we're not going to you're not going to cover it. What? what are you talking about? And they say, well, you know, we just said, we don't think it's per the terms of the contract. We're not going to. In cases like that, that's a breach of contract. That can be brought as what we call bad faith, insurance bad faith. And those cases can lead to huge punitive damages. It's one of the rare times when you can get punitive damages for a breach of contract. So remember that one. Uh, bad faith insurance, breach of contract, but generally you can't get punitive damages in a breach of contract. Um, there's lots of defenses to breach of contract. Uh, make sure you, you bookmark me, join my friend list here, and uh, I'll be talking about that in future uh, contract defenses, defenses to... I've got a great video, by the way, if you really want a ton of, ton of information. 
I have a YouTube channel. It's, it's called attorneystevevideos.com, attorneystevevideos.com. I have like almost 700 videos. I've got like so many topics. If you're in law, law student, legal secretaries, you're thinking about going to law, you want law school, you want to see, is law for me? Like what kind of things do you do? I've got it all there. Go to attorneystevevideos.com and, um, you know, just check it out. I got so much stuff. It would like blow your mind. Um, anyway, so breach of contract, we'll do the defenses and, and, and defenses to formation and defenses to breach on another day. Um, what I call contract college. That's what I call it. So, um, breach of the implied covenant of next one, breach of the implied covenant of good faith and fair dealing in a contract. Anybody know what that is? Bueller, Bueller, anyone? Bueller. So in every contract that you ever enter into, say you sign a uh, contract to be a, a, a baseball, professional baseball player, you sign a contract, they're in every contract you sign, doesn't matter, it could be any contract. And the whole world's full of contracts. If you think of all the things you do during a given day, buying a car, you know, signing up for a website, everything's a contract, okay? So knowing contract law is very, very important. Uh, but in every contract, there is an implied covenant, a covenant just being a promise. There is a pl an implied covenant of good faith and fair dealing. So even if somebody doesn't breach the contract per se, they can still breach the implied covenant of good faith and fair dealing. So there's a lot of scenarios that uh, that can pop up and, um, you know, things like that. But um Hey, guys, go ahead and share my live feed if with your friends. If you have anybody interested in, in uh, law, the legal process, um, understanding kind of, you know, if they're thinking of going to law school, share the feed. You know, this is a great feed. I, I talk about law uh, about 90% of the time, and I really just goof around the other 10% of the time. Um, so you have the uh, breach of the implied covenant of good faith and fair dealing. Uh, next one, breach of fiduciary duty. I love this one. I don't know why it just rolls off my tongue. The breach of fiduciary duty. It's just one of those fun ones. Now, th where does this arise? Now, this arises, let's take the example. You hire a real estate agent, okay? Uh, now, let me show you what it is and what it isn't. If you hire a contractor to paint your house, you have a contract, right? You pay him $1,000 to paint your house. You have a contract. Um, but it's it the person you're hiring that they don't owe you a fiduciary duty. There's no fiduciary duty that they owe you because they're just a contractor. There's no position of trust. There's no the law does not impose a position of trust on these people. So uh, but there are positions in life where the law says, you know what, this is a kind of a very, very important position. We're going to say that you have a fiduciary duty to your client. Okay, now you could probably think about that as a lawyer, as a copyright lawyer. If you hire me, I have a fiduciary duty. Why? Because I'm a lawyer, I'm a professional, and the law says, well, you should have a fiduciary duty to your client. Real estate agents as well, you have a fiduciary duty to your client. Now, interestingly, insurance agents, on the other hand, they're kind of kind of on the side. There's you know a couple cases that disagree and have some certain certain. But insurance agents often found not to have an insur a fiduciary duty. Now, what is a fiduciary duty? A fiduciary duty is the highest duty the law can place on a person. Okay, in the performance of their duties. So. If I have a fiduciary duty, you're my client, that means I have to have the utmost loyalty, competency, good faith, uh, fair and full disclosure to you, you know, no, no hidden secrets, no hidden profits. And so if you breach any of these little items, you can be held liable for damages for breach of fiduciary duty. So um, you see this a lot of times in real estate transactions where a broker's you know, doing a double escrow and nobody knew about it. Um, things like that. But um, breach of the fiduciary duty is a tort. Um, like I said, there's lots of case law, lots of different ways to get there. But um, take a look at that. Next on my list, we're moving into the C's. C's. Hey, you got any law friends, law nuts? Share this feed with them. You know, do, do, your, do your fiduciary duty to your friend and say, hey, turn your Steve's on. You got to go watch. 
Um, constructive fraud. Okay, so constructive fraud, that is fraud where um, you're basically you're taking advantage of somebody. That's on page 33. Let's take a look here. Um, it's contrasted with actual fraud. It's a breach of a legal or equitable duty which irrespective of the moral guilt or intent of the party, the law declares fraudulent because of its tendency to deceive, dishonesty of purpose, confidential relationships. That's why I say this where you have a, uh, a breach of a duty, like, like a, uh, um, it, it's, it, it doesn't pop up much, but just say you're taking, a, taking advantage of an elder, like somebody in your care, you know, an elder person, you're taking advantage of them. While it may not be considered fraud what you're doing it can be considered constructive fraud um and it's i'm just going to stop at that i'm not going to go into depth it doesn't pop up very often in law so uh but next i'm going to move in the c's i'm going to move to conversion conversion pops up this is a uh, always a fun one think of somebody uh takes your car for a joyride okay they hop in, they, a friend of yours grabs the keys, takes it out for a joyride, or somebody just, you know, steals your car keys and takes it for a joyride. And then they decide they don't want to return your car. What do you do? What's, what is that tort? That tort is called conversion. When you're converting somebody's property, it could be real property, personal property, some courts say even intellectual property, if you're converting it for your own purposes, you're depriving the owner the use and enjoyment of their property, you can be held liable to pay the fair use, the fair value of the property. Now, I think that only makes sense, right? That's called conversion, okay? That's a fun little tort. Let's move on to the next one. By the way, if you want to um, share this with your friends, you've got a legal nut in the family, especially law students. Law students love my channel. Attorney Steve videos. I have almost 700 videos. I, whoa, Frontline Lisi. I got a call coming in. You got a call coming in. <laughs> we have a, a busy, uh, busy legal practice, so uh, Lisa has to go take the calls quite often. Um, anyway, so I'm going to go to the next one false imprisonment. False imprisonment. Um, this is an interesting one. Of course, it's if an if a officer, a police officer, arrests you with no probable cause. Sure, that could be considered a false imprisonment. But um, there's other ways to get this. So say you, um, say you go to a party, okay? And uh, say it's a, it's a girl with a guy. A guy says, hey, well, come upstairs. And the girl says, oh, okay, okay I'll just check out, the, check out your paintings on the wall or whatever. So you go in and then the guy won't let her out. And she has no way to get out. She's stuck. Okay, that is considered false imprisonment. She could basically sue for that intentional infliction of confinement with no justification. Intentional, intentional infliction of confinement with no reasonable escape and no reasonable justification. So that is the tort of false imprisonment. Uh, again, people can claim some big damages and the worst in, in law, the worst uh, trauma, let's call it, that you suffer, the more damages your case is worth. It's just, you know, if it's something trivial, uh, he blocked the door for a minute and you got out, you know, it's you're going to have a problem. But if it was like he didn't let you out and this, that and the other, it's a different story. So that's false imprisonment. Next on F, we have false light. Okay, so this is um, this is what we call false light in the public eye. And this is when um, you post something on the internet or your Facebook channel, and it's true. It's true, but it also casts somebody in a false light. Okay, so you may say something, you know, um, you, you post a photo and you, you know that you're, you're kind of misrepresenting it a little. You're trying to get people to think something that isn't really there. And while it may not be false, it may also be a tort and actionable as a false light. If the reasonable person would object to that, if a reasonable person would object to that. So it has to be something that is, you know, highly objectionable to the reasonable person, as we say. In law, it's all about reasonable, reasonable, the reasonable person. What would a reasonable person have done? And as lawyers, that's what we argue. What, what is reasonable? What's not reasonable? That's what we argue in so many of our cases. We're arguing that. So false light, that is a tort. It's what we call one of the privacy torts. 
because people have a, you know, we have a general sense of privacy. We really don't have a lot of privacy in, in the world if you think about it. Your data is shared all over the place for money. Um, they're creating profiles, you know, there's marketing profiles being created and whatnot. So you don't have much privacy, but there is four torts that constitute uh, privacy torts. One of them is the false light. Another one is the misappropriation of your name, image, and likeness. There is also um, intrusion on seclusion and solitude. I love that one. Seclusion on, on your solitude where somebody's trying to come in and peek over your backyard and take a photo. Um, so that is false light, okay? Uh, and I'll talk about the privacy torts on, a, on another video because there's a lot more to the privacy torts. I love the privacy torts, they're fun because everybody relates to them. They go, yeah, yeah, oh yeah, privacy, okay. Um, all right, next one, moving on, fraud, fraud. Now this has to be, this has to be America's favorite word. Fraud, there's committed fraud. People go on Yelp, I was working with that business, frauded, I got defrauded, ah, they're fraudsters. It's the most used word I've ever heard in law, but most people don't really know the true legal definition of fraud. Fraud is basically a false statement of fact made to induce the reliance of another person, which doesn't re induce their reliance and causes them damages. So it'd be like, be like me saying, hey, come on in, you know, come on into Dirty Steve's car lot here. I got a, I got a, a, a Chevy Silverado, $5,000, Chevy Silverado, brand new, next to no miles. You come on in, you buy it. It turns out none of that was true. And you, you, it turns out that there, the, you know, I didn't tell you that the, the odometer was rolled back. I, I just kind of did forgot to tell you. Well, that's fraud. You know, you induce me to do something. I pay money. Then I get home and I find out that, you, you know, my neighbor who's a car expert says, what, what the hell? Did, what did you buy? And so then you go assume for fraud. It's that simple. A fraudulent representation. So there has to be that false representation of fact that is made for the purpose to induce your reliance, you do rely to your detriment. That is fraud, okay? So whenever you hear somebody saying fraud, 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 ask them, well, what, what did they say? What was the false statement? What did they say, okay? Attorney Steve told me to say that. And by the way, this is general legal information only, not legal advice. Um, don't rely on it. You know, laws are different in all the states. I practice in California and Arizona. So, um, you know, check your, I'm just, this is general legal information only. That's it. That's all I do. Uh, that's all we're allowed to do, to be honest. So I don't answer specific legal questions. I'm happy to talk law, but if it involves a specific legal question, then I can't do it. Um, next we have, uh, oh, this one's, uh, oh boy, this one, intentional infliction of emotional distress. As lawyers, we chop that down to I-I-E-D because it's too long to say I-I-E-D. What's that mean? Intentional infliction of emotional distress. That means the intentional or reckless infliction on another person of emotional or mental distress usually has to be severe mental or emotional distress. Oftentimes you need to show medical bills, records, you know, serious, serious signs. You had to go to the doctors, you had to go get some, um, you know, psychology meds or whatever they're called, psychotropics or whatever to calm down, who knows. Uh, it has to be something extreme and outrageous, okay? So this is where everybody goes wrong. They say, oh my God, you're causing me so much stress. Oh. Look, folks, there's a certain amount of stress that you're expected to tolerate in, in a society. We've got 7 billion people on the planet. There's a certain amount of stress that you're supposed to handle. You know, people are going to do things. They're going to bump into you in the mall. Somebody's going to say something you don't like. But when it rises to the level of extreme and outrageous conduct, um, that's when you can, you can, you know, and I think the case from law school was someone took an old lady and dumped her in a trash can or something and she just freaked out. So I think it was something like that, but it has to be extreme and outrageous. If you don't have that, if you don't have severe damages, if you can't show something severe, 
is probably not going to work. Hey, God, you know, you want to try, go for it, you know, but think about it. It had, if in the law, they're, the judge is going to look, is this extreme and outrageous? If, if not, your case is going to go nowhere anyway. All right. So that is intentional infliction of emotional distress, IIED. Um, next one on the list. Hey, go ahead and share this feed. You know, anybody that might benefit, you know, it's always, you know, it's always good to be a good friend, you know, to somebody because it shows them that you actually care. You say, Hey, there's this guy, attorney Steve, man, this, this guy's been like an 18 year attorney. He's handled over like 400 litigation cases. Um, he's also been identified by Unicort as the number one copyright infringement defense lawyer in the United States in terms of number of cases handled. Wow. Maybe somebody you want to share with your friend. I'm just saying, I'm just saying. All right. So anyway, let's get on here. Um, Intrusion upon seclusion and solitude. So everybody has a right to the, this kind of peaceful enjoyment of your life, um, you know, without an unreasonable intrusions from other people. And this would be the, um, what was her name? The ESPN reporter. Anybody know the ESPN reporter? Somebody's, uh, they were peeping through the keyhole. I can't remember her name. Lisa, do you remember her name? Uh Oh, Erin Andrews. Thank you. Frontline Lisey's always on it. She's literally 10 times smarter than me. Erin uh, Andrews. Yeah. So she was at a hotel. She's a, I don't know if she's still broadcasting, but she was a famous, very famous, uh, very beautiful um, uh, commentator, sports commentator. She was in a hotel and somebody's peeping through the keyhole. She had a huge lawsuit. But it's looking at intrusion upon the seclusion and solitude. A person has a right to, like, especially behind closed doors, um, you have a right to that seclusion. So somebody violates that, you have a tort, call attorney, say, hey, I got to get attorney Steve on the phone. This is ridiculous. All right, moving on. So I want to get through this list. So you have the A through, not Z. There, there really is no tort that, that starts with a Z, interestingly. And, uh, well, there is one with a Q. There is a thing called Quitam. I'll just throw that out for trivia here. Quitam and Kitam, as they call it. Anybody heard of Kitam? No? Nobody's heard of Kitam? Okay. Well, if so, here, this is incredible. If somebody is defrauding the government, the, the federal government, and let's say you, you know somebody, there's, uh, you know, somebody hasn't paid, you know, it's got to be a big amount. Uh, several million dollars, five million, ten million dollars in taxes, and you go, they are defrauding the government. There is a way to file an action against that person. I believe it is the Attorney General of the United States that you present your case to them. They have the first crack at it, okay? So they can say, thank you very much, we'll take it from here. And you get paid, almost like a commission or a referral fee, if and when they succeed. And that's called Kitam, Q-U-I-T-A-M. Not too many people even will ever have heard this word in their life. You heard it here. Why? Because you're investing your time and your knowledge. Very nicely done. Very nicely done. Kitam. I love that one. Keep thinking maybe someday I'll get one of those cases. But um, if you have somebody substantially ripping off the government, you can basically be basically a whistleblower is what you are. And then you get paid to do it. If they don't want to, if they don't want to run with the case, there's other procedures that you can do. Um, back to my list ends. We are at the ends. We're about halfway. Um, still, good time to share this feed with your friends. If you want to say, "Hey, I'm a guy. Here's my, you're my, you're my law friend, my law nut." You got to watch Attorney Steve. I mean, he just he just goes over all this stuff. He just got he's got it. Uh, negligence. Let's talk about negligence again. This is another word. Everybody knows what it means. It's a car crash, right? It's like how how did how'd you crash a car? That's negligent. Um, airplanes crashing. Uh, I was just watching uh, the Kobe Bryant story the other day. Um, he took the helicopter from uh, Newport Coast or Orange County, I believe it was, up to uh, L.A. area for his daughter's basketball game. Well, the the pilot crashed. And, you know, seven, eight people died. Well, that's negligence, okay? But from a lawyer's standpoint, we talk about it in, in more precise terms. We are, it's four elements, okay? It's very simple. Duty, breach of the duty, causation, damages. It's very, very simple. But there's a lot of nuances within these four elements. So, you, but you have to prove as a plaintiff, 
one, two, three, four. You have to prove all four elements. If, you're, if you can't show causation, you have no case. If you can't show that there was a duty, you have no case. If you can't show that there was a breach of the duty, you have no case. So when we're talking negligence, when you see it on TV, uh, you see a crash, you ask yourself, was there a duty of reasonable care? And there's a lot of different ways to find a duty is owed. Okay, lots of different ways. Was there a breach? In other words, failure to act as the reasonable person. Again, reasonable person. Did it cause causation? Did it cause the damages. Now there's other issues that can pop up in causation, for example. The, these are fun cases is where you have a car crash and then the ambulance comes in and then the ambulance is negligence, negligent and they do something wrong and then the guy dies. Well, can you hold the driver liable for the death? You know, that was kind of unforeseeable and it was actually an intervening act of a third party. So, you know, so you have these causation issues. Is that causation? But negligence, duty, breach, causation, damages, okay? Um, so that's a fun one. That's probably got to be the most oftenly cited tort in America. It has to be. Uh, just It's your wrecks, your car wrecks, your roof falling, your toaster blowing up. It's, it's your repairman doing things wrong. It's so many things, okay? So to no negligence, but it really, as lawyers, that's how we analyze it. It's four factors. Let's talk about it. Um, negligent hiring, that's pretty much the same thing. Negligent supervision, it's pretty, you can, you, I think you can get it. Negligent infliction of emotional distress, again, just a kind of a, a flavor of, of uh, negligence. There's negligent misrepresentation. So I'm not going to go into all that. You get the idea. Next, here's a good one. Nuisance. All right, so here, let me give you an example. So I know a guy, like, he bought a, um, he bought a VRBO, and then all, and his neighbor couldn't stand the fact that he was renting out his uh, property, right? And because they said, well, this is a community, and we don't like rentals here. Problem is the CCNRs allow rentals, like you can do rentals, you know, and so the owner said, well, I'm going to do rentals, you know, it's like I'm going to make some money. The, the next door neighbor could not stand it. He went crazy, nuts, posted signs, harassed the neighbor, harassed the tenants that would rent, did all this stuff. Just crazy, right? Well, there is a tort called nuisance. There is a public nuisance, one that affects everybody. And that could potentially be argued here in this type of case. Or there's a private nuisance, which is something just unique to you, you and your next door neighbor. But um, you can sue for things like that. You can seek injunctions. Uh, sometimes you have to seek restraining orders. And, um, you know, so that's a whole thing. You, you hope you never have to deal with those kinds of things in your life. But unfortunately, things do happen. Uh, professional negligence, again, that's a different form of negligence. Just dealing with you're an attorney, your accountants, your, doc your doctors, professional people. Uh, here's one uh, that you should know. Public disclosure of private facts, okay? So you may have, you may know some facts about somebody. Like you may say, you may say, I know my friend has VD. And you may say, you know, and it's a fact. It's a fact. You know, I know it. I've seen it. I was heard about it. I saw the diagnosis, everything. I'm going to post it on the Internet. I'm going to post it on the Internet. Well, you are now publicly disclosing a private fact. You may say to yourself, well, I have First Amendment. I have a First Amendment right. It's my right. Uh, no, it's not your right. And the First Amendment is not absolute. There are some limitations to it. This is one you're publicly disclosing private facts of another person that no reasonable person needs to know. There's no legitimate reason to do it. Somebody can sue you for that. So be careful before you post. Think before you post, even though it may be true and not defamatory because it's true. Like <laughs> see everybody. Oh, my gosh. She's great. Uh, <laughs> that's my beautiful wife and business partner. I met her at a software company in California, Newport Beach, years and years and years ago. Um, I'm going to try to get her on, and you should catch her on our podcast. We do a husband and wife podcast. It's called The Piracy Log. 
where we talk about the piracy cases of the week and things like that. So, um, but yeah, you can just Google piracy log. You'll likely find us. Uh, so public disclosure of private facts. Um, I have reformation. If a contract was accidentally created and it has the wrong terms and both parties go like, yeah, that's it just, I don't know, man, we, we missed that. You can seek to reform the contracts through the court. You can say, hey, we messed up. We'd like to reform the contract. Rescission of a contract, that's where you're just saying, um, I want to rescind the contract. A good example of that is uh, truth in lending, uh, federal truth in lending cases. So, um, you know, if things are not accurately done, if the numbers and the figures don't add up, if your if your truth in lending statement was not accurate, if you were not given written disclosures uh, of a right to cancel on a purchase loan, uh, for example, you can seek to rescind your loan, get your attorney fees, everything else under the truth in lending law. And we did a lot of truth in lending cases at uh, when there was the meltdown, okay, 2007, 2008. We saw that so many loans were just bogus. They were so poorly put together, lying, misrepresenting, you know, these option arm loans and all these other crazy things, the things that did not comply with truth and lending law. So we would rescind loans. Um, next on my list, respondeat superior. I, I'm going to get a shirt that says this, respondeat superior. Anybody know what that means? Respondeat superior. It's one of those Latin terms that we love all the Latin terms in law. Respondiat means respond. What does superior mean? Who's your superior? Um, this is when you do something wrong as an employee, and instead of suing you, I will sue your boss. Why is that? It's called let the master answer. Respondiat superior. Let the master answer for the deeds of their employee. So this is big. You see this all the time. Uh, employees commit torts. Um, you don't go, you usually go after the company because they have a duty to supervise. They could have stopped it. They could do better training. They could do all kinds of things. But respondeat superior is, is the claim, uh, the, the terminology. All right, next, we're almost done, guys. Strict products liability. Strict products liability. What's this? The exploding can of corn. Whoa. The can exploded and hit me in the eye or you know, put, took my eye out or something. or something exploding product, the defective, unreasonably dangerous product, okay? Um, this is really interesting. That's one of my favorite torts because it's, it's so unique in how you go after. So if you go to the store and you buy, a, you buy a, let's say, a bottle of champagne, you open it up, thing explodes, I, the piece of glass cuts your eye, let's say, okay? There's a zillion different scenarios on how a product can injure you, injure you a zillion different uh, scenarios. Um, who do you sue? Who do you sue? Do you sue the champagne company, the manufacturer? Well, of course, definitely. They made the bottle. But did you know you can also sue the distributor, the company that took in the truck or the plane, they took the product to the, to the retail company? You can sue the distributor. Oh, didn't know that. Yeah, and you can also sue the store where you, you, you know, if you bought it at Walmart, okay, you can sue Wine Barn or whatever it is, you sue them as well. So you sue what we call up and down the chain. And then the concept is they all have insurance and then they figure out who's going to pay who and what and how that's going to work out. It's a lot like construction defect cases are the same way. Everybody sues each other, contractors, general contractors, subcontractors, everybody's got insurance. They figure out who gets the money. Um, so those are, you know, things like that. But strict products, liability, everyone up and down the chain. A um, couple left, trespass. I think you all know what trespass is, you know, going on to the property of another. Now, there are defenses without authorization. Um, you know, you walk into someone's lawn and they say, you're trespassing. Yeah, of course, we all know that. And there can be a civil trespass and there can be a criminal trespass. If you trespass on government property, it could very well be a criminal trespass and you could do jail time. Um so you have that, and now you have a thing called the defense of necessity, and the case that comes up in law school very often is you got a boat dock, right? You got a, you got a mansion with a boat dock at Newport Beach. Lucky you, lucky you. And there's a storm, and a boat decides they're going to come tie up to your dock. Well, technically, 
they're, it's your property and they shouldn't be doing that. It is a trespass. But there's defenses. All of these torts, by the way, have defenses. You can raise defenses. So even though, yeah, it happened, you can raise defenses to, to eliminate your liability. One of them in this case would be, well, it was a private necessity. I would have, we would have died if I would have went all the way down this storm and I was out of gas and I had to use your dock. It's a private necessity. That can be a defense. Where the homeowner would just say, hey, you know, sorry, you know, that's life for you, right? Sometimes you got to help your neighbor out, so to speak. So, um, and then let's move on. Unjust enrichment. This is where somebody gets money that they're not entitled to. Uh, sometimes that means they have to pay it back or pay restitution hey, is another word. But um, Good, let's move on. Final. I'm just going to do the final one here. The W's. Uh, wrongful or malicious institution of a civil proceeding. This is where uh, I, I filed a case like this uh, uh, recently against some company tried to tried to hijack my domain, one of my valuable domains. I, I buy a lot of domains. I had a company thought they were going to get it uh, for free, basically, and sued me in a UDRP uh, case with Weepo in, in Switzerland. They lost, I won, so now I'm suing them for a wrongful institution of a civil proceeding. This is where somebody is suing you without probable cause, uh, many times with malice, uh, just you know, try to just to try to harass you, uh, things like that. So malicious prosecution, and there's also malicious prosecution by a prosecutor, you know, a prosecutor that has no good faith, no probable cause, and they're bringing you through maybe like a political type of prosecution. So guys, that's it. That's all I have for now. I got a lot of other things on my list, but that's just a quick run through. I just gave you uh, what would probably take you a year in law school. I just gave to you what in less than, less than an hour. That's what we call the very quick version. Uh, of course, there's lots of details. This is not, you know, do not rely on this. this is not legal advice. It's general legal information only. Remember, laws differ in each state, so check your own state rules. But I hope this uh, educates you a little bit. One of our missions is to try to provide equal access to justice, and you do that by making law more understandable. And if you know, because if people can understand how to access their rights, how to access the courts, you know, they have a chance to basically defend themselves, even if they can't afford an attorney. That's what our YouTube channel is all about. We're up to about 37,000 subscribers. Uh, I call them friends, but join us, if you will, at attorneystevevideos.com. That's attorneystevevideos.com. I got lots of great stuff. We put out all kinds of videos, usually a couple per week, but uh, check it out. I thank you for joining me today. I got to run. I got this tremendous caseload and uh, a lot of clients. I got to make sure everybody's happy. Why? Because I have a fiduciary duty, right? All right, everybody. Thank you so much. Have a great day. Go forth and conquer. Carpe diem.